You're listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit ppe.mercatus.org. I'm Virgil Storr, Research Associate Professor of Economics at George Mason University and the Senior Director of Academic and Student Programs at the Mercatus Center. And I'm here with my colleague and dear friend, Peter J. Becky. Peter is a University Professor of Economics and Philosophy at George Mason University and the Director of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center. Peter is the Dean of the Austrian School of Economics and expert in the history of economic thought and importantly for our conversation today, an expert on the Soviet Union. So I want to talk to you about the October Revolution and war communism and the new economic policy. But if you'd permit me to ask a few theoretical questions before asking the historical ones. Why was Marx so bothered by capitalism and what system did he think should and would eventually replace it? Uh, Well, first, thanks for uh, having this conversation with me. Um, I greatly appreciate that, Virgil. This was how I started my career was in Sovietology um, and Marxian economics and political economy. Um, The the important thing to understand about Marx was that he was a radical, um, but I don't mean that in like the silly kind of radicalism that we often attribute that to, but an intellectual radical in the sense that he sought to get at the root cause of social ills. And so he lived during the period of time uh, of the uh, transition uh, into the due to the Industrial Revolution um, and the aftermath of that. And so he was studying industrial societies and trying to look at the root causes of social ills uh, that plagued them. One of them was the uh, um, uh, sort of volatility associated with business cycles. Um, the other one was the um, sort of immiseration of certain aspects of the working class. Um, and uh, so Marx wanted to sort of address that. And the way that you have to think about it is, is that in his philosophical manuscripts, he emphasized alienation. Um, in his economic uh, writings, he ex- uh, uh, emphasized exploitation. And the trick is to see the connection between Marx, the philosopher, of the uh, economic and philosophical manuscripts, which puts the blame on the private property as uh, the uh, the alienating ability of mankind, and the later Marx, which focused on the mechanics of the capitalist system uh, and the problem of surplus value, and to see the connection between the two of that. And then that generates his overall project, which is that what we need to do is to Um, You need to abolish the private property system in order to be able to address the social ills of exploitation. Um, And so this is what makes for the totality project, um, which is why Marx is such a fascinating intellectual, because he has this whole architectonic system that you're addressing And uh, what is he, uh, the problem with capitalism, of course, is that, um, though Marx might not have said this, but one of the ways that you could put this is that um, the only way to get rid of the injustice that he identified with exploitation was through transcendence of the alienating structures that was the private property system. So rather than like sort of simple reformism, which was on the... Uh, a lot of people's minds in the 19th century as they saw the industrial worker, they saw the, uh, the difficulties in cities, uh, urbanization, they thought of different kind of reform measures. And Marx uh, saw uh, those as petty bourgeois measures that would not address the fundamental issue. And so instead, what he wanted to do was address the system as a whole. Um, one of the best examples he uses Um, is uh, one of the reforms that some socialists had at the time was that the problem was money. Money is the root of all evil, so let's get rid of money. And Marx's response to them was, look, trying to get, uh, you know, abolish the problems of uh, capitalism by getting rid of money is is similar to uh, abolishing the pope while leaving Catholicism intact. 
He says what you need to do is you need to abolish Catholicism, then there's no need for the Pope. Similarly, if you abolish the commodity production, private property economy, and the commodity production, then you'll abolish the need to have money. So that's the kind of radical thinking that he had in mind. So again, the only way to overcome the injustice was through transcending from the alienating relationships. And so that radicalism captures the imagination of intellectuals. So, but it's one thing to say, let's tear down the capitalist structures because they're the root of the problem. They're the source of the problem, right? They're the, they're the thing that give rise to alienation and exploitation. But what's left in its stead? What did he think would be there after you got rid of capitalism? Yeah, so I think, again, so our teacher, Don Lavoy, um, has a fantastic book called Rivalry and Central Planning. And chapter two of that book, is all about Marx. And uh, he really sort of um, explains in detail that you can't read Marx unless you read him as a methodologist, <laughs> which is that you have to understand what his methodology of dialectical materialism is. And so Marx, so a lot of people like to look at Marx and say he was a great critic of capitalism, but he was silent when it came to what socialism would look like. And what Don argues, I think persuasively, is that a Marxist would have understood that the way you describe the positive image of socialism is through the critique of capitalism. And so that the positive image comes from the negative analysis of the critique, right, which is what a scientific, so the difference between Marx as a scientific socialist versus Marx criticizing others as utopian socialists is that Marx disciplined himself intellectually through the dialectic that he had to talk about the negations. Um, that's what it meant to talk scientifically. And so I think the easiest way to think about what Marx thought socialism would be is the opposite of the invisible hand. So if the invisible hand is what's going on behind the backs of the individuals with an under capitalism, uh, you're going to bring that, expose it, the difficulties of that through the analysis and then you're going to have the opposite of that um, as the picture that you see is what's going to solve the problems of, uh, of, of the current world and the promise that socialism has. Okay. So if it, so, so the invisible hand gets replaced with some sort of forceful actual hand directing or driving economic relations, or is that too simple a way to put it? Is there a sort of better definition of the socialism that well, <laughs> Marx had in mind that you could offer? Um, it's, well, Marx has some very interesting ideas which make it difficult to pin him down, right? So one of the things you have to remember is that he thought, because of the base and the superstructure idea, that capitalism had, in fact, generated tremendous productivity gains. Um, and so if you think about uh, Marx and the, and the uh, synthesis, antithesis, I mean, the, the thesis, antithesis, synthesis kind of idea, um, what you have is a period of time where you have primitive communism, which has good social relations, but bad economics. And then you have sort of this modern world that he's criticizing, which has good economics, but bad social relations. And the synthesis should be able to combine those. And so what did he see? He saw an increasing concentration in management uh, of the industrial workplace and so there were gains to be had from the great sort of monopolization and benefits, but it wasn't being driven for the benefit of the social relations. And so he needs to somehow have a transformation. And if you look at the German ideology, he believes that we're going to be entering into a post-scarcity world. And so that none of us would have perfectly designed, you know, positions so we'd have cycling, no standing bureaucracy. So if there's no standing bureaucracy, there'd be no interest group to dominate and rule over other people, right? And so this is the reason why he can have a planning apparatus but not have a planning interest, right, in the same way that you would under capitalism. Um, and so, so he does believe in the replacing of the invisible hand. He uses the analogy of a conductor and an orchestra. So the economy is kind of like the orchestra. And then his argument is that none of the members of the orchestra have to own their own instruments, but I still need the conductor to conduct. But if you actually follow the German ideology or later Trotsky's literature and revolution, the belief was is that if I can overcome the division of labor 
any one of us could be the conductor on any given day. Therefore, no one has the bureaucratization interest to dominate and rule in my, you know, for my friends, which I would under monopoly. So I don't have the same monopolistic privilege, even though I have the same position, <laughs> but I'm switching. There's other people switching all the time. So this is, so, you know, this seems like a potentially good deal. Why doesn't this, why doesn't this work? What's the, what's the, another way to put the point is what's the Austrian critique of this uh, system that Marx was outlining? So it's, it's, um, so there's various different levels of the Austrian critique. One of the fascinating things when you study the history of this is, is uh, Nikolai Bukharin, who was a leading um, uh, Bolshevik uh, intellectual, probably the leading Bolshevik intellectual. Um, he was sent by Lenin to Vienna uh, to attend the Bambavrik seminar uh, in the uh, early part of the 20th century because he was to learn uh, the, the criticisms of the bourgeois theorists that were criticizing Marxism. Uh, Bambavrik, who was Mises' teacher, was involved in a very uh, elaborate debate um, with um, Rudolf Hilferding and other Austro-Marxists um, over the issue of Karl Marx and the close of his system. So uh, Bambavrik had written this book in the late 19th century called Karl Marx and the Close of a System, which you could took on all the different versions of Marxism that related to these issues having to do with exploitation, surplus value and whatnot, didn't really take on the alienation points. So this is part of the reason why they bifurcated those, which, um, you know, philosophers worried about alienation, economists worried about surplus value. Um, and then the business cycle theory and other kinds of monopolization. There's certain propositions about the economic world that come out of Marx that lend themselves to strictly economic analysis and actual butting them up against reality. One of them is increasing concentrations of capital. Uh, one is a, uh, you know, pushing wages down to subsistence level. Um, you know, there's... Uh, uh, some of them have to do with solutions, which are having to do with whether or not labor units could be used as the calculator rather than prices. And so the Austrian criticism could be a technical criticism uh, having to do with labor theory of value and emphasis instead on the subjective theory of value. Um, the Austrian criticism also came in terms of the idea that when you tried to think about these labor units, that the problem is is that labor is not a homogeneous unit, but comes in heterogeneous. There's different types of labor that get used, so you can't use a homogeneous unit as your measuring rod. And then the other one is simply the marginal productivity theory of factor pricing, which is how is it that um, you know factors, including labor, uh, get priced in a market um, and whether or not there's this surplus value that retains or whether or not that surplus value gets competed away uh, through the alternatives in the market so that workers tend to get paid the value of their marginal product or the more correctly the discounted uh, value of their marginal product. Um, and then there's the big me meta criticism which comes from Mises. So Bambavrik's criticisms were more focused and narrow and in many ways they did have a devastating effect on Marxism within the field of economics. And so Marxism as a organizing intellectual framework moved into disciplines like sociology, into history and, and, and whatnot, and did not have as big a role in economics post the marginalist revolution um, as one might have uh, anticipated um, or thought given the impact in the world that Marxism had. Um, but it's precisely because Marxism was so important in the world that then the Austrian criticism moved from this kind of more narrow economic criticism to a broader critique of planning and the and what Mises wrote when Mises wrote uh, his book Socialism, which is a very has very technical economic argument called the economic calculation argument, but it also has a much broader philosophical argument about the nature of a liberal society versus um, a non-liberal society um, or a collectivist society. So just to, to read you a passage from Mises, um, he says, it must be admitted that the idea of socialism is at once grandiose and simple. We may say, in fact, that is one of the most ambitious creations of the human spirit. 
the uh, attempt to erect society on a new basis while breaking with all traditional forms of social organization, to conceive of a new world planned and foresee that form which all human affairs must assume in the future. That is so magnificent, so daring, that it has rightly aroused the greatest admiration. If we wish to save the world from barbarism, we have to refute socialism, but we cannot thrust it carelessly aside. And so it's that challenge which Mises took up in his analysis of socialism that then Hayek took up in, their anal in his further analysis of socialism that is against the backdrop of the worldwide march towards socialism after World War I. Uh, and that includes a uh, failed revolution in Germany, uh, the Austro-Marxist uh, uh, ascendancy in Red Vienna uh, that Mises and Hayek, in fact, lived through, um, the uh, efforts at, um, uh, obviously, the Russian Revolution in, in, in Russia and, and its, and its uh, aftermath and the idea. So the Marxist idea in the Russian Revolution was that it would be the spark that would set off the revolution across all of Europe. And at the time that people made that argument, there was a lot of reason to believe that argument would be true. Yeah. So I, want, I absolutely want to get there. But before we get there, I want to just ask the question. Just to, You mentioned the calculation argument a couple of times, but you didn't really spell it out. So yeah. what is the calculation argument? So remember what I said before about the abolition of private property in, it, in the means of production. That was a key part of getting rid of the alienation which is necessary in order to get rid of the exploitation. That's the totality aspect of this whole project. So what Mises focused on was the issue of what are the implications of once we get rid of private property. Now, the oldest argument in intellectual history actually goes from all the way back to Aristotle's critique of Plato, challenging the, the incentive effects of getting rid of uh, private property. But there was something a little different about the trying to use that argument against socialists because, again, going back to Marx, he had this idea that the base uh, would determine the superstructure. And so, therefore, if you actually have a transformation of the base, you're going to transform the ideas, which means that the kind of incentives that the individuals would face will actually be endogenously changed when you get rid of private property rights. So you'll no longer be as greedy or anything like that, right? And so it would have been a non-starter to simply, just like it's a non-starter to say, I believe in individual freedom, you believe in collectivism, we stop talking. And if I sort of made the argument that private property rights provide incentives, and you came back and said, but I'm going to abolish private property rights, and we're going to have a new human being, then by insisting on incentive effects, it's not going to work. So what Mises did was he said, okay, let's assume for sake of argument that um, everyone wants to do exactly what it is that you want them to do. Now, part of the project that was necessary for Marxism was, if, if you remember this base superstructure idea, it was a rationalization of production, meaning that the anarchy of commodity production would be replaced by direct planning, the conductor conducting the instruments, and, um, and doing so rationally. So it wasn't that Marx wanted to have a back to the earth movement, uh, right? Marx wanted rationalization of production, which would lead to a burst of productivity so that we could move from the kingdom of necessity, a world governed by scarcity, to the kingdom of freedom, which is a world in which we're beyond scarcity, which means that we don't have to worry about division of labor and all of the other things, okay? So Mises decided to focus on this linchpin argument, which is if I abolish private property, how am I going to get the ability to sort out from the array of technologically feasible projects those which are economically viable? So if you imagine that under socialism, or in, a, in a more flippant way, he in essence said, okay, comrades, how am I going to get the chickens to fly into the comrades' mouths? It was like he, he wanted to go to a real sort of gut level of how are you going to deliver the goods? How are you going to deliver these goods of this burst of productivity? But let's get a little bit less flippant about it and just say, so imagine I engage in an investment project and I need to build a railroad track. And the question is, is whether or not I should use steel as an input or platinum into an input. So both are technologically... Uh, you know, feasible 
to do. And in fact, if you just relied on technological information, you might choose platinum because it might be an actual stronger metal, smoother metal, you know, easier for us to be able to have our trains run smoother on. The reason why that sounds like an absurd example to you right away is because you'll say, oh my God, platinum's really expensive. And Mises' point was, you know that because you know that it has a price in the market. But if we've eliminated private property, we've eliminated exchange. If we eliminate exchange, we eliminate the prices that exist in the market. So how would you know whether or not platinum was relatively uh, more uh, desirable in some other use than in the use of building railroads, unless you have, in fact, prices. And so in Mises' world, you need to have private property in order to have the exchange. The exchange gives rise to the prices, and the prices are the inputs into the calculation of whether or not a project is viable or not, that meaning it's profit and loss calculus, is that I want to buy low and sell high. I don't want to ever buy high and sell low. If I buy high and sell low, resources get lost. They go out of the system. And so it's this core idea about economic calculation that even if we had socialist man in charge, they would still have to engage in economic calculation. But I can't engage in cal economic calculation if I eliminate private property. So then... Where do I go with that? And that's that's Mises' beginning of the elaboration of that argument. And then the further elaboration of that argument sharpened what became the Austrian school all the way through. Yeah. So with that on the record, now I want you to tell me a little bit about the October Revolution. What was it? When did it occur? What were the revolutionaries hoping to achieve? So in the spring of 1917... Lenin had been in uh, in exile, and he returned to Russia. Um, there's a lot of controversy over this particular uh, episode because um, he was smuggled in by the Germans in order to be able to try to help, uh, you know, end the the war. Um, there was dissension uh, going on in. Um, in, uh, in, in Russia itself, the czarist regime was, was uh, weak and toppling, and Lenin helped push that over. His, his book uh, called The State and Revolution, uh, which came out in the spring of, of 1917, um, is, is, is very intriguing to read given that background. Um, so anyway, the, 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 the Russian government went through a variety of different uh, twists and turns over the next several months. Uh, with Lenin back in the country and, and working with his other revolutionaries. I should point out that uh, Lenin, uh, for a long time, was involved in the Russian Marxist um, and revolutionary movement. Um, he was um, uh, radicalized uh, after his uh, uh, death of his brother, um, and he was also had a great teacher, um, uh, named Plakhanov, who was the leading Marxist thinker in Russia. And uh, in the uh, political debates, um, the word Bolshevik means majority, uh, Menshevik means minority. And Lenin was always actually in the minority. He was part of the group that uh, pushed for this radicalization and quick, quick revolution. The revolution would have to happen immediately. Um, but in a vote in, 2000, in 1905, he was able to get Plakhanov to side with him. And so for one time, he had the majority in the vote among the Social Democrats. And from that time forward, he was just called the, 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 uh, the Bolsheviks, um, even though they were actually the minority among the, the socialist uh, thinkers. But uh, in the uh, fall of, uh, two, of, of 1917, 100 years ago, uh, this uh, next month, uh, Lenin was able to take advantage of the collapse of the provisional government and um, ended up by having a fairly bloodless revolution takeover uh, of uh, the idea. So it wasn't like a, a, you know, storming of the castle kind of, you know, bloodless thing. I mean, uh, there's uh, some writers and filmmakers who have tried to make more out of that than what actually exists um, happens. But uh, one of the best uh, books on this is actually by the American John Reed called Ten Days That Shook the World. Anyway, they the Bolsheviks are able to take over power. 
and Lennon stands in front of them, and there's a great scene in 10 Days It Shook the World, the book. Uh, the movie Reds actually is a kind of fictional, fictional depiction of this, um, this book that John Reed wrote. But um, John, uh, John Reed tells the story. He says Lennon stands, grabs the podium, stares out among the audience and just says, now we will construct socialism. And that's it. The audience, you know, the, the followers are very excited and, and Lennon walks away and that's it. And that's kind of, you know, what happened um, in the situation. Now, um, again, the, uh, so in a lot of ways, the Russian revolution did uh, mimicked in many ways, the fall of the communist systems in 1989. If you go back and think about that time, uh, they were pretty much sort of just this collapsing of the system and then the takeover of the system uh, by the governments. I mean, really only in Romania did you have the kind of uh, violent uh, revolution uh, of that time. And uh, I don't want to overstate it. Was, there was violence involved, but it wasn't like how we normally think of a revolution as being violent, but uh, it was well, not the American Revolution, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it, and it wasn't that long and protracted. I mean, it was kind of like the provisional government couldn't hold. Uh, the czarist government had proven it couldn't hold already before that, um, and so the so there was a kind of a a liberal and and uh, there was this, the provisional government is made up of a of a hodgepodge of the various different uh, factions. Uh, one of them's the cadet party, which is um, kind of what you might ver view as a kind of liberal party. And there's various different social democratic aspects of it. Anyway, they none of them can actually hold the center. Lenin's able to take advantage of that. And then the revolution is in his hands and he takes over power. Now we will construct socialism. What did he mean by that? And what did he try? What did they actually do? Oh, well, it's, it's, it's so, <laughs> so it's quite interesting because it's not abolition of anarchy of production. So in my, my book, which was my dissertation, uh, we'll come back and talk about that. I, I think maybe in a little details in a second, I have on uh, page 105, not that all the readers out there have it easily to look at, but, uh, it's called the political economy of Soviet socialism. It costs you an arm and a leg, but, you know, I'm going to argue that it's worth it. Um, but on page 105, I have a, the set of decrees. And just to give you an example, right after the revolution, they formed the People's Commissar. And then the very first thing that they did on that same day was also de a decree on land. So they abolished the landlord's right of private uh, private property and confiscated all landed estates. But my favorite one is actually January of 1918. Um, and it's the Declaration of the Whites of the Working and Exploited People. And what it did was it said, we're going to abolish the exploitation of man by man. Right? So these are the kind of things that they did. Now, it's important to keep in mind that for a later conversation, it's important to keep in mind is that the Civil War doesn't break out until June of 1918. Um, and so we don't have the Civil War uh, until June of 1918. And the Civil War ends in October of 1920. But just to put a, a, a fine point on this, in prior to the outbreak of, of the Civil War, right, June 1918, Right. Besides the January abolition of exploitation of of uh, 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 elimination, abolishing of exploitation by man by man. In December, they established the Supreme Economic Council. They also had the declaration, declaration, declaration and nationalization of all banks. They made illegal dividends and interest payments. Uh, they repudiated all their foreign debt. They nationalized all foreign trade, they abolished inheritance, okay? That's, and then they finally gave uh, the food commissar extraordinary powers to combat the village bourgeoisie who were concealing and speculating on grain reservation, which meant that they could have um, arbitrary confiscation of all agricultural products. And that becomes key part because that's when they, and then remember what I said, so that's, and that's all before the Civil War is declared against the whites versus the reds. 
uh, which was in June. In October of 1920 is when that war is over. But they, um, after that war is over, November 1920, they have a decree of the Supreme Economic Council, which says that all enterprises with mechanical power are now owned by the state. So they they so the point here is that before the Civil War broke out, they engaged in this extreme centralization. And after the Civil War was over, they continued to engage in extreme centralization. So to me, this is what they were trying to implement. And the question you asked is, you know, what were they trying to get? The abolition, this totality project. Now, you know, obviously there's a debate. Was Lenin the only faithful Marxist reader or whatever? And you have to read. There's a huge debate about that because there's evolutionary socialism. There's, uh, you know, uh, the kind of Leninist strategy of socialism. There's different things. I think a good argument can be made is that Lenin was the most consistent and coherent of the Marxist uh, interpreters, but obviously there's there's um, different ways that that argument can go. So there's a it's clear from the the proclamations that you read out that they were trying to destroy capitalism, right? Because they're getting rid of private property, they're they're you know taking ownership for the state, they're doing all sorts of things like that. It's clear that they want to be they want to introduce some kind of planning because they have the central council that's going to be making proclamations and what have you. Did they get the economic boom that was supposed to follow when we get rid of capitalism and replace it with planning? Did that did that occur? And did we get the elimination of the exploitation and alienation that was supposed to happen no. when that happened? No. In <laughs> fact, they, between 1918 and 1921, they have one of the largest collapses of the economy that we've ever witnessed. Um, and... Um, and so they were in the spring of 1921 forced to in order to stay in power, they were forced to retreat. And it's quite fascinating to read their reaction, the various different leaders uh, reactions at the time about what they were trying to do. Um, Nikolai Bukharin, who I mentioned earlier, um, wrote a famous paper in the mid 1920s. He, he was the main architect of what later became known as war communism, but at the time that he was the architect of it, he, uh, um, he, he, he re wrote a book uh, called The ABCs of Communism uh, with Priyo Brzezinski, um, another leading intellectual figure of the Russian Revolution. And uh, that, that's what they called it, communism. They didn't call it war communism. That was historians came up with that name later on to try to isolate what happened in this massive collapse. But um, they, uh, um, in 1921, he also was the architect of the new economic policy, which was their retreat from the communist era. But in making that retreat, what he argued was that we've learned our lesson from the most learned critic of communism. These, these are, I'm, not, I'm paraphrasing them somewhat, but the, some of these quotes are direct quotes. Learned critic of communism is a direct quote, Ludwig von Mises. So in the actual Soviet records, uh, you have the leading theoretician of the party singling out Mises as the person that he's learned from that we have to retreat. But his argument is that in the, in the end, we will have the last laugh because his argument is the reason why we didn't have the great output that we hoped is because we didn't have, we weren't yet in a burst of productivity that would have eliminated division of labor. And so we were stuck in a world where you still had to have division of labor, but we had incompetent people in charge of the planning bureaus. And so in the future, they'll learn what it means to be appropriate planner. And when they learn that, then we will get Soviet planning. All right. And then once you have Soviet planning, then you'll be able to have the burst of productivity, which will overcome the scarcity problem, which means you no longer have the division of labor. And so it's a kind of a fascinating argument when you're reading it because you're like, what is he actually saying? Because he's admitting that Mises is right, but only for this moment in time. Right. And in the future, we'll come back. And that's why when they did the uh, transformation in the new economic policy, they retained the commanding heights. 
So what they got rid of was all the unnecessary nationalized little firms. You know how I mentioned that thing in November yeah. where they had all these little firms, they were all nationalized. Let's get rid of all of them. So I have a fact that's kind of intriguing in the, in the industrial census of 1923. Um, by that time, they had already privatized now, privatized 88.5% of firms in the industrial census. But that 88.5% of private firms employed only 12.4% of the labor force, whereas 8.5% of the firms were state enterprises, but they employed 84.1% of the labor force. So all the industrial labor force was now in these commanding height industries. But they were, and, and the idea was, is that we're going to become acculturated. We'll learn how to manage the firm with, with you know, by the way, just this is a, um, this might be sound too flippant, but when you're reading again, it's quite jarring, but it was very common at the time. So Lenin, in describing what the Soviet system is going to look like, pointed to German war planning as the sign of efficiency. Everyone did that, by the way. So, but it, but at the time, it's like, okay, we're going to uh, combine, listen to what he says, we're going to combine German war planning with Soviet democracy, and this is going to be the Soviet Union. So his idea was that the Soviets, which are worker councils, that's the meaning of that term, workers' councils, but with this efficient war machine, is going to be combined together, and that's going to give us the future. So the problem right now is that our managers and our worker councils haven't learned Taylorism. What I mean by that is the, the sort of Frederick Taylor notion of piecemeal management of how you design advanced industrial production. They haven't learned that yet, and because they haven't learned that, we fell short of what our goal was. But in the future, we're going to, we're going to be able to do this. But never again in the Soviet history did they engage in the same kind of totality project that Lenin and Bukharin had in mind, the complete abolition of the commodity production, the monetary system, and all that. And instead, it always became, it became a centrally um, managed economy, but not necessarily the kind of centrally planned economy that Marx and Lenin and them originally had in mind. So does the... You know, so I guess this this raises an interesting question, right? Because they the does this this sort of experiment in total communism, right? That happened during war communism and the retreat, you know, during the new economic policy. Does that is that a does that is that in any way tell us anything about the workability of socialism, Marxist socialism as a system? Because they seem to have good excuses, right? It happened too fast. The, the the people in charge didn't seem to be the kind that you know have had the experience with advanced capitalism that you'd want them to have if they were going to usher this in. Maybe it happened even in the wrong place. Uh, maybe the, the the sort of spark that was supposed to happen from Russia to the world didn't happen. And so and so in which in which way is this experience actually a test of 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 communism or is it not a test of communism is it you know what do we learn from this from 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 this experience this episode that you described so i mean that's a very complicated uh, question not only um epistemologically the issue of what what do we mean by tests in the in the in the world because there's so many other factors going on that we can't isolate and whatnot so I think what we do know and what we can learn is that uh, the kind of consistent and persistent and coherent vision that would come from a reading of Marx, both the early Marx and the later Marx, and as embodied in a totality project, does not have the ability, because of Mises' argument, I would argue, about calculation, doesn't have the ability to achieve what it sets out to do. So now one of the in interesting fascinations of this, going back to my earlier point that Lavoie stressed about the negative being implied, uh, uh, the positive being implied from the negative image of capitalism, is that imagine that if you take away the Archimedean point of what a future socialist world would look like, and then instead... Now, that 
that point, that point of, of pure socialism is no longer possible. Now, how do we judge Marx's analysis? And I never wrote it, but I always had an argument, uh, that a paper that I wanted to write under the influence of Don called Mises and Marx, Rivals on Rivalry? Question mark. Because one of the really great points about Marx is actually when he studies the economy, he emphasizes this rivalrous behavior, the constant churn, the adjustments and dynamics of capitalism. Um, if you read what he and Engels actually say about what capitalism has delivered uh, to the, uh, the, the least advantage, it's actually the greatest improvement in the history of mankind up to that point. It's just that he had this other vision out here. And even his business cycle theory, which is a disproportionality business cycle theory, is actually at the core very similar to a kind of an Austrian theory of the cycle because it's based on disproportionality between the production sector and the consumption sector getting out of whack, which actually is the coordination problem that the Austrians identify. And so it's this kind of stuff that if we eliminate the idea of being able to step outside of time and then uh, make the world anew, that all of a sudden a lot of Marx's insights about how markets operate are not the criticisms but the positive analysis of a dynamic uh, uh, market economy. So I would say that, you know, in my own work, what I tried to do, uh, it's a very, very uh, straightforward idea. I, uh, in many ways, uh, Don Lavoy published this path-breaking book called Rivalry and Central Planning, and it was an intellectual history of a debate that had contemporary relevance because the economies in East and Central Europe were starting to fracture in the mid to late 80s. This is precisely the time when I was in graduate school. And Don had two responses to his book. Universally, his book was well regarded. It was published by Cambridge University Press, and it received very uh, strong uh, endorsements by leading uh, people in the field. But he had two criticisms. One of them was that Don didn't talk about the alternative of worker-controlled systems in Yugoslavia. And the other one is that he didn't talk enough about the Soviet experience. And so in many ways, my best friend in graduate school, Dave Perchicko, and I sort of took up the task of defending Don on his two flanks. And so we devote a lot of time and energy, both of us, in, in addressing these issues. Dave uh, um, went in the Yugoslav direction and worker control systems. We both studied languages of the countries. He studied Serbo-Croatian. I was involved in studying Russian for many years. Uh, we both ended up by spending time um, over in those countries. Uh, Dave uh, was a Fulbright Fellow um, in Yugoslavia. I was a guest of the Academy of Sciences in Moscow. Um, and so we really sort of tried to address these issues um, in, our, in the beginning part of our career. And we both wrote sort of responses to people that were challenging Don on those flanks. And, um, and so what I did was I tried to jump in to, to defend Don's uh, thesis about the economic calculation debate. What I tried to do was jump into a history debate, not an economics debate. I tried to jump into a debate in Russian history, in Soviet, in Russian history, all right, um, that had towering figures in it. And I tried to identify the various different strands and then stake out the positions and then say, how would we reinterpret these debates if we looked at it through the lens of the economic calculation debate? If the economic calculation debate had determined that you couldn't engage in, if you abolish private property, you can't engage in rational economic calculation. Therefore, because you can't engage in rational economic calculation, you can't engage in this rationalization project of the process of production. And therefore, that explains the collapse, right? And then what kind of measures need to be made in the net period to try to get quasi-markets back involved and, and then what the consequences are for the Soviet system going forward. And I tried to do that by, by resolving a debate over war communism and the new economic policy, and then also an intellectual history debate on industrialization policy. Like, what were we trying to do with industrialization, which is the beginning of the Stalinist period? And so that's the way that my first book sort of lays that out um, and tries to go after each of those. And so I don't know if that answers your question, because it's unclear that we can actually get a definitive test <laughs> 
But what we should do is we shouldn't talk about these issues in ignorance of what actually happened when we tried to, however, in perfectly implement aspects of it. And so to me, it's extremely important to stress the inability to engage in rationalization of production. And it's very important to talk about the consequences in terms of political tyranny that result when you concentrate power in one party. Um, because in our efforts to try to achieve this move from a kingdom of necessity to a kingdom of freedom, we end up by having a refractory reality which doesn't give us a kingdom of freedom, but instead delivers the very opposite of what we wanted. And I think that we can also pay attention to the voices of leaders in socialism themselves. So Trotsky, as he has to escape from Stalin's clenches, is you know writing things about the bureaucratization and the, 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 the bankruptcy of the revolution. Now, does he believe the bankruptcy of the revolution is because the bad guy got in charge, right? That's how most people describe it. Yes, but there's something about what he's identifying, which we could maybe offer a better theory of than just bad people got in power, right? We can sort of explain the systematic logic behind why it is that someone like Stalin would rise to the top. Yes, it's very helpful. And so you 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 mentioned your first your first book, and I guess I wanted to, and you, you described yourself as trying to jump into a, a, his, a debate in history, not a debate in, in economics. And I guess the question that, that raises for me is just sort of what empirical strategy did, did you pursue and, and why did you pursue the, the, the empirical strategy that you, that you did? So I was very fortunate because studying the Soviet history is that there were um, – basically two periods uh, which were heavily studied in America and throughout the, the world, right? Uh, the one of them was the founding period and the other one was the collapsing period. So you, my book came out in 1990. The Soviet <laughs> Union didn't collapse until 1992 and, and East and Central Europe had their revolutions in 1989, but I defended before those revolutions happened. So this book was written before that happened, but it was all going on at the time. So you got to remember when I first started writing the book, solidarity movement was going on. All these different things were, were happening around us and we were trying to understand it. And so understanding this debate was important. But the reason why I bring that earlier stuff up is that economists had come to a consensus on certain facts. It's not like economists debated that in 1921, there was between 1918 and 1921, there was this huge collapse in the industrial output in the, in the economy. That everyone agreed with. The question was why? So it wasn't a what question, it was a why question. And so that's where I thought I could jump in because economists had agreed that uh, about the data they had agreed that there was a price scissors you know problem in in the in the in the mid 1920s uh between the exchange ratios between the city and the country so i wasn't reinterpreting their data in terms of I, I, that's the wrong way to put it it wasn't that i was coming up with new data to overturn an existing set of hypotheses or propositions i was offering a theoretical lens that would change the way you debated about those those out, uh, those things, and so that's what I. Uh, so I was a, I I did history, um, and I was fortunate at the time because uh, Don Lavoy um, and Jack High um, had, from the time I was a first year graduate student, decided that they wanted to emphasize empirical approaches for all young Austrian economists. And they and Deirdre McCloskey had published a paper in, nine, in, in the very beginning of my graduate career uh, called The Rhetoric of Economics. It was in the Journal of Economic Literature. And the power of that paper methodologically was that she argued that there was multiple forms of evidence. So there wasn't just one form of doing of an empirical strategy. You could do narrative history and be doing good economics history. So cleometrics is the use of like statistics in history, but it's also the use of economic way of thinking in history. And at the time, the use of economic his the use of economic way of thinking to make sense of historical uh, phenomena uh, was embraced 
and McCloskey gave us a reason to believe that there was alternative forms of evidence. And so since the pressing question that people were challenging Lavoy was, was that he didn't understand enough about Russian history, it was a historical debate that I had to answer for Don to be uh, seen as being okay, right, on this. And so I studied how to do history at least as best as I could. I tried to develop the techniques that uh, they do, which is language techniques, but also interpretive techniques. It, it wasn't easy. I mean, I remember, especially the Soviet stuff, I think I've told you this story before. I, uh, uh, You know, Stalin and the Soviet propaganda machine tried to, you know, always change the meaning of things. So they would rewrite history. So you could read the 1926 Party Congress and in 1926, it said something different from what it said in 1936. And it said something different in 1956 about what had happened in 1926. And I can remember going and talk to Don and saying like, Don, what am I supposed to do with this? It's like all over the place because that influenced also the way certain historians also read the record because they would choose which one they would read. And I remember Don's advice to me. He says, choose the one that makes your argument the hardest to make. Right. That was his advice. So I was remember thinking like, man, you're making it hard for me. Why are you doing that? I should pick the one that makes it easiest for me to make. He said, no, no, no. You know, he says, that's the only way that you can deal with these kind of things. And he really stressed, you know, that uh, this idea that like when I was taking on E.H. Carr or I was taking on Stephen Cohen, that I had to pretend that they were sitting right in front of me. And so, I, again, remember the context of the time, which was that socialism was collapsing right in front of me. So the easy thing could have been to do is to laugh and scoff at someone who once one time believed that socialism was going to be so wonderful or everything like that. And I will tell you a little bit of story. I was uh, I was at a, um, uh, the American Association for Slavic Studies uh, in around this time, and Stephen Cohen was on a panel with Elena Bonner. Elena Bonner was the dissident wife of Andrei Sakharov. And uh, anyway, she was up there and and uh, Stephen Cohen was was a professor at Princeton at the time. Now he's a professor at NYU, um, but he was very pro uh, market socialism. He wrote the famous book on Nikolai Bukharin. He doesn't really understand, in my interpretation, Buchanan's uh, Bukharin's position with respect to war communism. And then with NEP, he just thought that Bukharin was all NEP uh, and that NEP collapsed and therefore Bukharin was pushed out. And if only Bukharin, he tells a good person story. If only Bukharin had been the guy rather than Stalin, like life would have been nice and, and glorious. And uh, so that he saw uh, Gorbachev as the modern day Bukharin. And that's the way he framed all of his, he used to have a column in the nation and all things like that. And Elena Bodner was on the stage with him and she started to attack him as a bought and paid for academic by the Soviets and everything like that. And I was sitting there and I remember Don had always told me to be as charitable as I possibly could, but I got a great chuckle out of the fact that this dissident who everyone revered was taking Cohen on. I was like, Don should have let me say that too, but, but I hopefully the book actually turns out to be better because of Don forcing me to take on the hardest argument that I to make the position I wanted to make. At least I think that's what he did. And we went through many different things. You work Virgil work closely with Don so you can know when I would get drafts from him and they would be filled with that red pen. You know, it was dreadful because I would look at it and I'd say, Don, there's more red on there. There is black. And, you know, and I type that, you know, and, and he'd be like, no, no, rewrite it. But it was a great experience. And uh, I learned a ton working with him and working on through all of those arguments um, and the history. And I drew great respect for historians, both uh, those who I agreed with and those who I disagreed with. And uh, I would like to see more young economists, political economists, do that kind of history work today. I mean, it's one of my big things. I want to see that uh, as opposed to using data uh, to test a current model on an old data set and call that history. I actually want to see telling, and, and, and that led me, by the way, when doing that, it, it, my, my book is more or less, this first book was more or less the history of kings and queens, right? Because I'm talking about Lenin and, and, and you know, Bukharin and all these people like that, the leaders, and not the people. The people somewhat get lost in the story.
But when I wrote my second book, because I wrote this book like this, when I wrote my second book, which was on the collapse of communism, I tried to write it more from the bottom up rather than the top down. And one of the best comments I ever got from it was from a Soviet economist who wrote to me and said that he loved my book because it reminded him of the dinner conversations that they had at their table about the life that they lived in trying to, you know, make ends meet. And to me, that was like, oh my God, I captured exactly what I was trying to do. But that's because I wanted to do a social history. And even there, it's not quite as good. It's still a king and queen. So I still think the idea of doing a real social history of socialism would be very valuable to do. So me, so you, you, you talk, you mentioned your second book, um, um, Why Parents Strike a Fail, which I think is a, a, you know, I think is a great book. I also want to talk to you about some of the work that you did not on the Soviet system and how it was, how that work connects, if it connects at all to the work that you've done um, on the Soviet system. Is there, is there a line that we can draw through your, your research that, that sort of connects them or are they just you picking up new projects? No, I mean, it looks like I pick up new projects, but I'm not that creative. They're actually variations on a theme. My, my other, when my other professor had a big influence on me is James Buchanan always used to say it takes varied iterations to force alien concepts upon reluctant minds. And, uh, my fascination, uh, with the Soviet, uh, system has a variety of reasons for it. But very early on, I, I latched on to this issue with Mises, um, because of my undergraduate teacher and, when I heard this calculation argument, I was just transfixed and I became obsessed with it in many ways. And so all of my discussions relate in some sense to the implications of that calculation argument, as I understand it, the background conditions which make it possible to engage in economic calculations, those which distort it. Um, and studying those institutions that enable calculation, those institutions that uh, distort calculations or, in fact, in, 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 uh, block it from happening. And so the transition period was kind of fascinating for me because you're trying to then study how it is that I now create the conditions which fix the problem that otherwise wasn't there and how difficult that was. And so the reason why I didn't keep doing Soviet stuff, you know, and post-Soviet stuff is because the... My, my temperament, so if you think about the Misesian split between theory and history, I would add in there that there's a middle ground called uh, institutionally contingent theory, but for sake of argument, let's just go with theory and history. History can come in the form of ancient history or contemporary history. And to me, public policy is contemporary history and ancient history. But some people are really good at contemporary history or public policy stuff. I am not. It's not that I'm, uh, you know, somehow averse to it. It's that I'm just not, I don't, it's, it hap happens too much in real time. And I like a little distance to sort of be able to retrodict rather than to forecast. Uh, so I know what happened in the Soviet Union in 1921. The question is why what happened? But I don't know what happens today, tomorrow. And I have a theory that might, about what might happen but I'm much more comfortable. And so as I was traveling and doing the stuff in East and Central Europe and, and, and the former Soviet Union, it became more and more apparent that everything was like happening like this and changing and a lot of politics. And again, like once politics gets involved, it becomes really this weird kind of thing. So what am I to do when Fodorov, who was the finance minister says that we got to introduce markets and then you know uh Chernobyl Muldrin who was the uh the the sort of basically second in command to uh Yeltsin at the time is like the age of market romanticism is over you know and it's like okay wait a minute one guy says we haven't had markets yet the other guy says we're not gonna have markets how am I supposed to deal with that and so you know the pinnacle of my work on that was to try to interpret that in terms of various different kind of little conceptual ideas with games and and uh, maybe some signaling issues or things like that. But I wasn't going where I wanted to go. So I then went to economic history of development, uh, right? But so transition was one, get the prices right. But in order to get the prices right, I needed to have an institutional framework of private property, contract, rule of law, 
Well, in order to get that, I needed to have other kinds of attitudes and belief systems and whatnot. And so each layer of the onion, as I peeled it, it led us down further into a more examination of belief systems, of underlying ideologies, you know, things that I find fascinating, but which are far remote, remote, excuse me, from the way economists think about uh, their model in a strict sense. Um, and I didn't want to just have God of the gaps, which is I'm going to exhaust this, but then whatever's left, I'm going to call that ideology. Or, you know, in the old days, what, you know, Don used to talk to us about with Clifford Gertz, right? Is that, you know, what do we mean by culture? Well, you draw a circle around whatever and you say, ah, see culture <laughs> that that seemed to me bankrupt intellectually. So instead, I wanted to sort of study these things. So I then went and started studying development economics um, and how it is that we had difficulties. If you think about P.T. Bauer and the move from small scale trading to medium sized trading to large scale trading. Well, we could understand how that took place in the West. Why didn't it take place in sub-Saharan Africa? Why did it, you know, get derailed in Latin America and these kind of questions? And so again, note what I did, I had to look backwards in time because I already then had a what question answered for me. And all I had to then focus was using my lens from Austrian economics and public choice and new institutional economics, could I do that? And then, as you know better than anyone, you know, we ended up by writing this paper together about how do we think about political economy when you take into account all of these things that I just said about the prices, about the institutions, and about the culture. And we talked about this notion of the various different embeddedness of social activities. And that's where that idea then became kind of, so it comes from the calculation argument, but it's a different twist on the calculation argument. Um, and so I'm not saying that I didn't learn in the process. I was very fortunate once, you know, especially once I got to GMU here, uh, that I had really, you know, great colleagues, most of them being graduate students, that were very interested in these issues and looked at these things with fresh eyes and gave me new ways to think about these ideas. And then I started thinking about them slightly differently and then they, they went forward. And so that to me was really amazing aspect of our research that led to then the way we study uh, not only transition and failed in weak states, but then, and how you endogenously create the rules under which we try to interact. That led to the work on the positive program for anarchism, uh, which all we meant by that was endogenous rule creation rather than uh, you know, uh, some kind of absence of law or chaos or whatever, is how is it that rules get created in environments where the rules are what's up for grabs? Um, and then also what led to the project on post-disaster, um, which could be man-made like in war, or it could be through nature. And the reason for that was because that's a shock to the system that then has to be reformed. That includes its social capital and other things which get destroyed not only because of the storm, but because of people moving away because of the storm. So, you know, there's an infrastructure that gets wiped out, but there's also then people have moved out. And with, when those people move out, all that social capital goes with them. It doesn't stay there. It's, it resides in the people. So what happens when they come back and they have to reform it? And what's the interaction effects between commerce, civil society, and the, the sort of more formal structures? And, and that has led to a very vibrant, I think, research program on civil society, again, through an economic lens uh, somewhat. And, uh, but yeah, I don't know if that answers no, your question. No, it's but, a yeah. perfect answer. The, uh, so we mentioned two of your books explicitly in a couple of your papers, right? We mentioned the political economy of Soviet socialism, the 1990 book that we spent a lot of time uh, talking about. We mentioned Why Perestroika Fail, which is about sort of this transition period, this collapse period in, in Soviet systems, it's like 92, 93, mm -hmm. a book and that came out. We mentioned a couple of articles, but if people are interested in, in, in sort of what you were talking about in particular at the end, but, but throughout this uh, sort of whole thing, what, what book of yours, what set of papers of yours should they maybe look at? Well, on the economic calculation issue, I did a, a nine volume reference volume uh, that they should get from their library, not try to order it, uh, with Routledge that covers the debate uh, pretty much from Marx all the way up to 2000. 
and all the various different articles. And that's why it's nine volumes. Um, and I would recommend like looking at those those papers. And then since 2000, there's now new papers uh, that are coming on board uh, that need to be uh, looked at and incorporated. But that's the theoretical debate um, over the nature of economic calculation. And I'm actually preparing a paper for the 100th anniversary of Mises' uh, paper, uh, which came out in 1920. Um, which is on the way in which Mises' argument influenced other strands in economics, from the Austrians but all, and public choice people, but also to the mechanism design folks and other kinds of uh, mo modern models of market socialism, all efforts to try to answer Mises' challenge. So I think that, you know, the, my book, Calculation and Coordination, which has that name, uh, it should be, so Hayek wrote his book, Prices and Production. Without prices, you can't coordinate production. And what I tried to say is without calculation, right, you can't get coordination of, of your uh, economic affairs. And so you need to have this, this uh, you know, calculation ability. Um, that book is interesting because uh, it was supposed to be a, a final trilogy. So the, I was supposed to write a book about the origins. That's the first book. And then I was going to write a book about the Stalinist period, which is the sort of rent-seeking economy kind of period. And then I was going to write a book about the collapse, which is why Perestroika failed. What happened with the Stalinist period is that that, that just became papers and never really coalesced into a book like it was supposed to be uh, for a variety of reasons um, that uh, can articulate or can articulate at times. Um, but those papers are in... Uh, the uh, calculation coordination uh, um, book, as well as some other studies um, that are then. And then after I was done with the calculation coordination book, which came out in 2002, um, every, you know, so, so many years I get, because of my past, I get invited to come and give a talk. And so I've gone back and revisited those. But most of my efforts in that time since 2002 have been more on this uh, development uh, uh, transition having to do with non-socialist economies, but um, other economies that suffer from crises and the adjustment or recalculation process that takes place in that idea. And in particular, this methodological idea that to do those kind of studies, since we're talking about the institutions are what's frayed, and the institutions are fundamentally built on belief systems, that it's my conjecture that the only way you can get access to that is through more and more and more ethnographic approaches. So I wanted to put people in the field. I want to, I, you know, against uh, institutional review boards, I would love it if we could still do, you know, participant observers, meaning, you know, I would go up to a graduate student, I'd give him a copy of Mises' Human Action and now say, you know, go to this war-torn area and try to set up a business and take all your field notes and tell no one, by the way, that you're an economist. Just have, Now, that's a violation of these various different norms nowadays, but I think Irving Goffman, you know, really was, was uh, quite a revolutionary in making us think about what radical ethnography could offer. And I would, I've spent a lot of time thinking about that, but then, of course, being brought back into studying it. I think that one of the really important lessons from the socialist experience um, which I talk about in a new independent review paper for the 100th anniversary, which is out this fall in the fall issue. Uh, many different people are in it, so, uh, but I'm one of the people that have a paper in it. But um, it's, this, it's this kind of effect of humanity and socialism. It still seems to me that there's a strong belief al among a lot of intellectuals and scholars that socialism would be a wonderful system, but humanity failed to live up to its ideal. And I think the lesson from the grand experiment of the 20th century is that humanity didn't fail to live up to socialism, but socialism fails to live up to the demands of humanity. Meaning that when we try to construct or orchestrate such a system, it is simply incompatible with the basic human striving and interactions that are required for us to live better together. 
it forces us into an existence which is in fact not our better selves but our worst selves and a great book on this on social history of stalinism is a, a book by um orlando's Fig, orlando figus called whispers which is the effect of the whispering in the totalitarian soviet state at two levels one is is that since we don't want to be told on when you and i have a conversation we have to whisper rather than having an open and free conversation but also parties to those conversations and whisper what we whispered to the leaders because that's the way that they get ahead. And I think it's this kind of idea which people like Hannah Arendt had their finger on in the 20th century, that obviously Mises and Hayek had a different finger on it, that uh, Popper, you know, sort of had a finger on it. And I, and I fear that, you know, because now communism collapsed 25 plus years ago, that the generation of kids haven't you know, grown up, you know, thinking about it, that they're very attracted to the slogans uh, about socialism and, they, and they're not thinking about what the consequences of the logic of socialism is. And so I think it's very important for us to push that again, to make them think about that. Now, does that mean that you can't have a socialist project in the future that could be viable? Yep, what well, you could. But what it does is it has to be one that is not an abolition of private property. Uh, it has to be, right? So you would change the fundamental definitions of socialism. And then, you know, you could have a socialist project which cared about equality and, and these other kinds of values. And we could, in fact, see a system that would do that. But it can't rely on an abolition of the market economy. It has to actually utilize the market economy in a way to promote civil society. And to me, that is an embracing of the kind of free interactions that would constitute a, a, a kind of a just social order um, based on rules that allow us to live better together, to participate in a market economy that's based on profit and loss and to live in caring communities. That is, a, I think, a, a perfect... Uh, way to end. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for this opportunity. And, uh, you know, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, great opportunity for people to go out and study uh, what the meaning of Soviet socialism was all about. Thanks. Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the F.A. Hayek Program, visit ppe.mercatus.org.